coming up next. Book and it reads, My Main Man, Tremaine, comma, Johnny. Wait, what? J- Johnny Tremaine. Oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Hey everybody, and welcome to Booking It, where four Christian homeschoolers discuss books. I'm your humble and eloquent host, Cooper Cobbs, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Matthew Killingsworth. How you doing, Matthew? Howdy. I'm good. Uh, for those of you who listen every week, uh, you know that there are two more people on this podcast. Uh, Isaiah, he is, he's is he been working hard this week, and he had to catch up on some school, being a good man. Right, Matthew? Mm-hmm. Except that he missed this. Yeah, it's okay. We don't judge. We don't judge here. Tanner, meanwhile, is on vacation. All right, so Cooper, I got a question for you. I'm looking at the script here, and it says baggage, now called history books. Would you like to explain this? Uh, Welcome to a segment I like to call history books, formerly called baggage. We're changing the name because history books is way better, and it goes with kind of the theme of the podcast. Wouldn't you agree, Matthew? Matthew, give me your history books with Johnny Tremaine. Yeah, let's open the history book of Matthew's history with Johnny Tremaine. <laughs> That's so bad. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying give me your baggage, okay? Just give me give me the give me the history. All right. So, my history with this book Johnny Tremaine is I had to read it for school. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. It was like 2 weeks ago, what? Something like that. Yeah, 2 weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, is yours any different? Yeah, that's it's a little uh, Okay, okay. Cooper, yeah. tell us about your story. Yeah, so Johnny Tremaine, you know, um this has been on okay, no pun intended. It's been on my bookshelf for a long time, you know. Um, not on mine, but like on the school bookshelf outside, uh, outside my room. And mom has always been like, "Dude, you gotta read Johnny Tremaine." And I was all <laughs> like, "Yeah, no, I, I don't really want to read Johnny Tremaine." And then she took me to a friend's house, and mom like really told the friend's mom about me not wanting to read Johnny Tremaine, and she was like, "Jonathan," which was the uh, my friend's older brother. Tell Cooper how much you like Johnny Tremaine. He's like, "Uh, it gets better." It gets better, but uh, I still didn't really believe him, even though I, you know. Anyway, uh, a couple years later, I picked up and tried to read the introduction. Well, it was in the first chapter, and I, uh, I think I made it past like the first paragraph, and I kind of failed. Um, but this was like a few years ago, so I, I don't think I really would have liked this book, even if I had read it a few years ago. But then um, I read it for school two weeks ago, and I was like, oh, I have to read Johnny Tremaine, you know. But I was, you know, being a more mature self. Um, I was oh, more yeah. like so mature. I was, I was more like, yeah, I think I can read this now. And I read it, and actually enjoyed it more, way more than I thought I would. So that's kind of oh, my, yeah. yeah. This is my yeah. favorite book we've had to read for school. This favorite year. book, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I would say it's a close first over Call of the Wild. I think. Yeah. yeah. I agree. This one's just it's pretty dense. It's pretty dense. Mm-hmm. So, what are your opening thoughts though on Giant Tremaine? I like, um, I like all the history in it, and like, I know it's historical fiction, but there's still a lot of historical accuracy in it. Yeah. I thought that was good, and like how, like how uh, involved they made him with all the stuff going on in Boston, and with all the other leaders and like founding fathers whose names you've probably heard, you know, like like, Samuel Adams, Paul Revere, all those guys. You're probably like, how did I hear about this Johnny Tremaine guy? That I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's literally what it is. I mean, because you're like, gosh, I feel like I could be there. Yeah, they definitely drop you right in the middle of the time zone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I think that it's actually it's, it's well written, even though it's a dense. But oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, I think she perfectly captures Boston at the time of the revolution. I think mm-hmm. that's great. Speaking of she, Matthew, you have some background on Esther Forbes, the author of Johnny Tremaine. Esther Forbes' parents' names were William and Harriet Merrifield. And. Uh, uh, or sorry, her, her mom's name was Harriet Merrifield Forbes, and uh, she was born on June twenty eighth, eighteen ninety one, um, in Westboro, Ooh, Massachusetts. I know, yeah, way back then. And um, so she wrote Johnny Tremaine on December eighth, nineteen forty one. Or no, that's when she started writing it. But that's right um, after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. History game. Go ahead, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> so she started on December 8th, 1941, and she wrote it for the next two two years until she published it in 1943. Um, she went to school at Bradford College, and she died on August 12th in 1967. 
Nice. Nice. Yeah. So, so. Um, I, this is, I haven't looked it up. I meant to look it up, but I think that at some schools this is like essential reading for fifth graders. I think so. Mm-hmm. And I think that would Johnny, make sense, I think. Uh, yeah. I think Johnny Tremaine is kind of like a bronze bow. I think that you would appreciate it if you read it a later in life than like fifth grade. Because I don't think if I'd read Johnny Tremaine in fifth grade and even Bronze Bow in fifth grade, I did not think that I would have liked either of them in fifth grade. What about you? What do you think about that? Yeah, I didn't read Bronze Bow until seventh grade. Yeah. So. Same. I, well, I liked it okay then, actually. I liked really? it. Really? Yeah. yeah. I liked Bronze Bow in seventh grade, but I don't think I would have a couple years before. Yeah, mom read this out loud, like, when I was, I don't know, third grade maybe. And I don't think I liked it as much as I did when I read it last year. No, two years ago. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think that I I really enjoyed the Bronze Bone. I definitely would not have in fifth grade. I think the same as Johnny Tremaine. But uh, uh-huh. why do you think that you would not have liked Johnny Tremaine in fifth grade? Because of how long it is and um, how I, I've never really liked history that much, even historical fiction, until... Yeah like i don't know the last few years now i think it's pretty interesting and that's part of the reason why i like the book so much a big reason actually and uh but back then i remember liking uh the rush revere books oh, have yeah. you read those yeah yeah uh i, I love those books and that was pretty much the only his history or historical fiction that i liked at that point yeah yeah i mean i think you know have you heard the rule like don't let your kid read the book if the protagonist or the main character is, like, within two years of them. It's not within two years of them, I mean. Have you heard that rule before? No, I haven't heard that. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of at least, homes, homeschool moms won't, like... So Johnny Tremaine is, what, 14, 15, 16 in the book, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, fifth grade, they're probably, what, 9, 10? I think that just a lot of the issues that he faces... Like, you know, even Scylla and uh, just a lot of the other stuff that he goes through, I think, would hit more strongly with the older person than with a younger person. What do you think? That makes sense. That makes sense. I don't know if they shouldn't allow them to read it, but I think yeah, they'll definitely no, I just like it better. It'd... Definitely, yeah. yeah. I think it'll make them like it better at that age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, John Tremaine, the silversmith, right? Yeah. Throughout the whole book, Johnny, he always uh, he always thinks, I'm made for a silversmith. You know, a couple of times that only a silversmith can do or, you know, stuff like that. Uh-huh. Do you think that he, uh, sorry, do you think that people are made for, like, certain professions? Um, or, you know, they're just, I mean, all of, all of their well, talents. Well, everyone's made, in. everyone's made for a purpose, yeah, so, I mean, but only God knows that. So, he thought he knew, and he had, like, all the pride, and he was so, like, proud of himself to be a silversmith, and he liked to brag about how good he was, and he was... You know, everyone envied him and everything, and yeah. he loved all the fame f- that he got from it. But um, that's because he thought he knew what God's plan was for him, but he didn't. Only God knows. So I think, yes, everyone is made for something, but they don't always know what that is until God chooses to reveal it. Reveal it. How much do you think uh, of what profession you end up being is God-given, and how much is, like, your own hard work? Um, I think it's all God-given. In what way? Like, even if you worked really hard, God could still, you know, cause you to get in a car wreck at any random point or anything, you know, just like... Yeah, every day, every day you think like, every day is God-given. Every, everything is God-given. So. so even your hard work is God-given. Right. But, yeah, that makes sense. He, he made you, he made your body able to do the hard work that you do, or like... Right. Like, it, even in Johnny Tremaine's example, like... Uh, his body was perfect, I and mean, he had built up his body to be a silversmith yeah. until he got the injury on his hand and burnt his hand in such a way that he couldn't uh, hold a hammer anymore. Right. And so, and, and like it was, it was God given that he had the ability up until then. And then even the injury we find out was God given because it benefited him in other ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the book, hey, spoiler alert, people, this is a spoiler. He, uh, so in the beginning, you know, he gets his hand injured. At the end, he gets it healed, right? Um, and I think that that's sh- the ending is not great. I'm gonna go ahead and say that the ending is not great. You know what? What do you yeah. think of the ending? What do you think of the ending, Matthew? Yeah, it's not the best. Um, yeah. But I'm not too salty about it. I think the book was good enough. That, yeah. I mean, cause like, 
how are they going to end a story about the beginning of re- the Revolutionary War well unless they end it at the end of the Revolutionary War? So, mm-hmm. I mean, they had to just kind of cut it off at some point, or she had to just yeah. cut it off at some point. But it's more the fact that, like, he gets his hand back, and they don't do anything with that. And it's mm-hmm. more of like a, well, um, I sure hope he becomes a silversmith again. <laughs> but, you know, you never know, right? Yeah. You know, he might marry Zilla, or he, he might not. You never know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's also really frustrating for younger kids, too. So, John Tremaine, working on a son. Well, actually, let's go back a bit. So, uh, John Tremaine is apprentice to the lap, Mr. Lapium, the silversmith. And he seemed to think that piety, or religion, and patriotism were mutually exclusive. Or, in other words, could not coexist. Do you think he was right in this? What do you think? Um, patriot- patriotism. Wait, how and religion. And religion. Or piety, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think how he thought about it was necessarily true. Explain your thoughts. Well, like think about it like this. So, what if there's somebody on a, on a Sunday who's out of food in their house and they're really hungry and they need to go to the store to get more food? But if all the people that work at stores are like, it's Sunday, I'm not going to work at a store. Because no, that's n- that's not what we're talking about. Like. Like, he's saying, like, you couldn't be, like, a patriot in, like, the way that you're passionate for your country or something like that, and you're willing to kind of... You know, they used it kind of like a, uh, a, sl- a slang word kind of here. Uh, I guess that's the word you should use. But, like, and, and religion, like, mutually exclusive. Like, you couldn't be both of those at the same time. I don't think that's true. Yeah. Because, the like, part of the reason why they even like went to the new world in the first place was because they wanted freedom of religion and that was one of the first laws they established like in the in the constitution and in the um in it was the first amendment to the constitution too was freedom of religion freedom of speech so but like i mean he's saying that you can't be a patriot and you can't be religious at the same time is that true i don't think so yeah okay because you can be religious in anything you do. All right. Do you disagree? No, I'm just asking because you kind of went on a little bunny trail each time. That's okay. So you you kind of went on one of those like two, uh, like working on Sundays because he gets, uh, he's he was working on a Sunday when he burns his hand. Do you think that working on Sunday should be allowed, or do you think it should be restricted by the government? Um, I think it should be allowed. Mm, why? Because it's necessary. And, like, football players, like, their job, their work is to play football. So <laughs> if they weren't allowed to work, then <laughs> yeah. we wouldn't see fun- Sunday night football. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how was the Sabbath? So back then, you know, the Sabbath, you could not, like, work on Sabbath. It was very strict. How was the Sabbath, like, revered and protected today? I mean, it's not very much at all in comparison to back then but like i guess a lot a lot of people still go to church yeah i mean or, i don't I mean, do i don't do some businesses do they, are they yeah do like, they have like to chick-fil-a, offer a Sunday Chick-fil-A yeah. closes yeah that's Sunday. what i was thinking i was like that's punishment enough right there yeah. you know that's reverence enough right there <laughs> chick-fil-a <laughs> yeah yep uh but you think that christianity itself should be a matter of government or not um if if Christianity should be a matter of government, yeah, like it should. No. Should it be okay? Why like not? I don't. I don't think they should force people to be Christians. If that's what you're asking, or yeah, or the other way around. Yeah, that another way around. But I'm not saying. I mean, I I obviously think every m- member of the government should be a Christian because. You think it should be a requirement? No, I don't hope? think it should be a requirement. I'm just, just saying hope. they should because. That's what God wants for them. So yeah. So, throughout the book, especially in the beginning, John Tremaine is just so arrogant. He's, he's bragging, he's skillful, he's, he's a smith, silversmith, you know, but what's the difference between, like, having a pride in your work and arrogance in your work? Okay, so, pride, having a pride in your work is kind of, like, a little bit more, or just, like, a, a more extreme example of just loving your work and, like, um, being thankful that your body can do what your work requires and, like um 
but having arrogance is like kind of what Johnny got to the point of doing after those couple of years working there. After he was really skillful and he knew it, he, he wanted to make sure everyone else knew it too. And that's arrogant. And he shouldn't have done that. Because there's yeah, nothing like, wrong. There's nothing wrong with being proud of yourself for doing something or accomplishing something or getting really good at something. But when you're bragging about it and making right. a big deal about it and trying to show it off, then that's kind of arrogant. Yeah. You know, uh, I think, like, some of the best authors or I guess you'd go ahead and say, like, craftsmen in, like, really broad category, right? All of those, all the best craftsmen, authors, painters, you know, uh, silversmiths, uh, cra- you know, um, carpenters, they're mm-hmm. all the best when they're so humble, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I just think that some of the authors, when they wrote their book, they didn't know it was going to be some masterpiece, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't think Tolkien knew that The Hobbit was going to sell, you know, millions of copies. Lord of the Rings going to sell millions of copies. Mm-hmm. He, he just, he's like, I, I, have, I have a story to tell, or the silversmith, I, I want to make this, you know, and they make it, and they're proud because, hey, I, I did it, I made it, you know, and then, you know, it could, when you, or, you know, like in the case of like a book or something like that, if it becomes popular and you brag about it, then, then you're being arrogant, you're like, I am on the top of the world and I know it, you know, but when you're just being a humble craftsman, and you take pride in your work, but you don't let it go to your head, and you don't tell, you know, brag about it to other people, I think that's, yeah, that's exactly right. Anything else to say about that? Nope. So, let's move on. We meet the character Rab. I like that name. What do you think about mm. the name Rab? It's, it's a good name. I thought it was a little weird when he named the baby Rabbit, like, after that. I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't as good as just Rab. What yeah. do you think Rab stood for? Was that just his name, or do you think it was, like, Robert? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, I was thinking, I think like, just Robert. But like, no, I think yeah. it's just Rab, honestly. Yeah. But uh, besides his name being drawn well, what about the character? Do you think he's drawn well? Do you think he's believable, realistic? I don't know. I don't know. He might be a little too perfect of a person to be realistic. You know yeah. what I mean? But I feel like at, at, when you very first meet him, he is, like, a perfect person. Like, but, like how on earth is he that kind of guy? But, like, then uh, th- throughout the book, like, by the time he leaves, like, you've seen more sides of him, and, like, you've seen him get annoyed and stressed out and angry. And, like, at first it seems like he never gets angry. He's just, like, the most right. chill person. But then you start to see more of him throughout the book. I think we can all think of that person, you know, that you think, oh, gosh, they're just, they're perfect. But, you know, you really have to say, like, they have to do, you know, they have to, they, everybody sins, right? Everybody mm-hmm. gets angry. It's just hard to see sometimes. But, yeah. I think, yeah, it's I think just, everybody it's, could I think it's when, person. yeah, when people have really good self-control. Yeah. Like, that's what, that's what I thought of when we first met Rab in the book. Mm-hmm. It was just like, that guy has a lot of self-control. Cause, Definitely. Because he knows more than so many other people. Because yep. he's just around, like, the central of, of the whole, like, Boston uh, yep. ob- Observatory. Is that what it's called? Uh, uh, oh, Observer. Ob- Observer. Boston Observer. Yeah, the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, it's also kind of like the rebel base type thing in Boston. Yep. So he gets to hear a lot of stuff, and he knows a lot of stuff. But he just remains calm and just, yeah. Yeah. When uh, Johnny first meets a rab, he says that, so when Johnny meets a rab, you know, he's looking for a job since he can't be a silver smith anymore. Right. And he says when he first meets Rab that for the first time since his injury, he was able to kind of stand aside from his problems and essentially, like, see himself in a new perspective. Why do you think Rab made him do that? Or why did he affect um, that? Because I, th- I just, I remember him asking, like, some carefully placed questions, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, he just made him think about his own life, kind of, and made him think about what was more important and what was less important. And he was kind to him and gave him food he offered to let him, like, share his little um, attic room if he needed a place to sleep, and he right. offered him a job there, too, so. Right. Yeah, I just, I like that scene where uh, Rab's uncle is like, Johnny's like, hey, sir, can I uh, can I work for you? And he's like, hey, Rab, can, uh, <laughs> can this guy, can he ride a horse? He's like, he learned yes. to ride a horse? Yes. He's yeah. like, well, the Rab said it. It has to be true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and then Rab was wearing the white shirt and comes back in. The two other guys have ink all over them, and he has no ink on them. Yeah. yeah. He's like, perfect child. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I like, well, What are the character in, like, other books can you think of that, like, remind you of Rab a little bit? Like, 
well, obviously the first book I think of is Harry Potter, kind of like. Uh, are you kidding me? Bill Bill Weasley. Bill Weasley, you know really? really? You know what I'm saying? He's like, everyone's like he's the coolest guy ever, and you know what I'm saying? Yeah, a little bit. And and like. I just don't think I can get enough, you know, enough of Bill Weasley. Okay. I don't. I mean, I'm just go ahead, go ahead, continue with your illustration. Oh, there's no more. Oh, okay. Another example. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I mean, I was kind of putting on the spot there. Yeah, I don't know. I just think I I can picture like this character really well though. I think that it's drawn in that way. So, Johnny Tremaine, he can't find a job. You know, this is before I think the the scene that me and Matthew just kind of laughed about. He goes. So Johnny Tremaine, he's actually related to this uber wealthy family in Boston. So he goes to the Lights, which is their name for a refuge. And his mom, who died, she's related to the Lights, and he tells she tells him. Never to go to the lights except if you're at your lowest point. So he thinks, I'm at my lowest point. So he goes and he presents his token that says, I'm a light. And the Mr. Light has him arrested for stealing. So first of all, this wasn't really thought out well by his mother, was it? Like, oh, he has a cup, so naturally they're going to accept him. Like, that's something how it should have ended. Make, it'll make fun of. <laughs> yeah. So basically, I think this needs a little more explaining. So basically, he, his mom right. brings him to this place to get indentured. Um, and learn how to be a silversmith. She gives him this cup right. that, like, is a light family heirloom cup thingy. And um, so she tells him if he's ever at his lowest point or ever, like, is desperately needing of money or food or anything, then to go to the lights, show them Take the cup, and they'll give him some food because, or, you know, give him some wealth because he's a light. And, but, Mr. Um, light. so yeah. the guy, Mr. Or six. Mr. Six, light. Right? had five of these cups but he no he had five or there were five in existence he had four okay so there was six in existence he had five and then like the october before one of them had been stolen so when he comes in and shows him the cup he gets arrested because uh mr light thinks he stole the cup just to come back and try to get wealth so johnny was he at his lowest point should he have gone to the lights I mean, yeah, so yeah. since we had met him at the beginning of the book, I think that was his lowest point, when he literally slept in a graveyard <laughs> the night before. Yeah, it's, that's true. Wait, when when, you, when, you, when somebody sleeps in a graveyard, you're like, yep, they're at their lowest point. Mm-hmm. It is a, yeah. No, they're definitely at the lowest point. All right. All right. No more shout-outs. But oh, go ahead. we will talk more about the lights and that whole interesting part of the book next week. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. So, donor shoutouts. Donor shoutouts. So, we've got quite a few now. So, let's see. Let's see. So, we got Cooper's grandpa, Van Pappy, oldest donor. Super grateful. Thank you, Van Pappy. Um, we've got Isaiah's grandparents. So, thank you again for that. Too bad you couldn't hear Isaiah on this episode. You can bug him about that. <laughs> um no, and then we got Isaiah's uncle, Sebi. Uh, thanks, Sebi. Okay, Lizzie, still one of our oldest donors again. Um, and uh, my grandma, Nana. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, but Matthew, uh, how, what, if someone wanted to donor a shout-out, what well, would they, they do? They would have to go to patreon.com forward slash booking it and um, click on any of our four different uh, donor t- tiers. Um, and all four of them include a donor shout out That's among right. other benefits. That's right. Now, what are some of the other benefits, Matthew? So, for example, you can get a merchandise item every three months for twenty dollars a month. For ten dollars a month, you can listen to an exclusive episode every, every month. single month. That's right. Which we did the giver last month. You'll have access to that if you donate. And we're doing giver part two this month. And then after that, we've got some special books for you guys. Yep. And then for fifty dollars a month, you can choose a book slash series that we do um, once a year. You can't donate for whatever reason. Please go to your favorite podcasting app and give a review for us. We'd really appreciate it. It goes a long way in uh, just helping us continue to be able to make these for you guys. So, without further ado, we'll see you next week. Yeah, keep on booking it.